And so tonight we come to this thing of identifying cults and counterfeit gospels. And so we want to look at this, and I, and I want you to look at the passage of Scripture that's right here at the top. Um, there's three of them. Have your pen ready on page 29 at the top. Notice Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. And I'm going to put a few people on the spot and ask them to read a little bit here as we go. So look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, and I'll read that one first. Beware of, what does it say? False prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now who said that? That's Matthew chapter 7. That's Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain. And so Jesus is saying, watch out, they are coming. The Lord Christ is warning us. Um, Greg Woodbury, would you read Ephesians 4.14? So that we longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Okay, so look at this. You, you, we, we see that Paul is warning the Ephesian church, don't be carried away by these things. Don't watch out. You must watch out. And look at this. It's human cunning. Cunning, the, the idea of human cunning is the, this idea of, of planning something. It's, it's the idea of a, a really a nefarious plan, an evil plan, um, scheming, as it says here. And then 2 John, or 2 John, and verse 7, notice what this is. Pastor Lucas, do you mind reading that? For many deceivers have gone out into the world, yeah. those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver... And the Antichrist. Okay, so 2 John is written toward the end of the first century. So now we've had, you know, 70 years of the church rolling along. And what 2 John is saying is that those words that Jesus said, that the ravenous wolves are going to come, John is saying they've come. And we also see in Jude 3 and 4, this is not on your outline, but because our church has studied Jude, this is very, very important. I want you to look at the screens that are right here and, and just kind of notice these. And if you would, just write Jude 3 and 4 somewhere there um, on your outline there. But I'm going to ask Mike Todd, would you just read this from the screen that is there? It's a little bit of a read, but I want you to follow carefully along in verses 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So in verse 3 he's saying... I wanted to just write to you about the gospel like many other letters had been written and, exp and exalt the gospel and talk about the gospel and all of these things. But here at the end of the New Testament, at the end of the first century, toward the end of that, we see that, that false gospels and false doctrines were so prevalent in the church that God was leading by the power of the Holy Spirit in the work of the saints, God was leading to direct and to alert the people of God that there are many false doctrines. And look at verse 4. Certain, certain people have, look what it says, crept in unnoticed. Crept in unnoticed. You see, they don't show up at church with, or they don't show up on your TV screen with a big thing on their chest that says heretic. They come in sounding good, looking good, smelling good. I mean, the whole thing seems great until you start to look at their true doctrine and where they were, all, where they were coming from in all of this. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God. Notice that. They pervert the grace of God. So it's not like they're just coming up with a totally new thing. They're taking the grace of God and twisting it and distorting it and perverting it and even into sensuality. Now that doesn't only mean sexual sensuality. It can be other type of things, things that play to our senses. What are, the th what are our senses? Let's talk about the five senses. What senses do we have? Okay. Sense of sight. Sense of hearing. 
taste, smell. Isn't it interesting that all these senses are right up here? But then we also have the sense of what? Touch. And that's your whole body can feel that. But so the things that play to the senses, the things that look good, the things that sound good, things that smell good, taste good. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. And, and some of these certainly can be sexual, but we, but we see that it's the things that are of this earthly life, of the flesh. And that's where we see the cults and the counterfeit gospels come in playing to the things of this earthly life. Appealing to your senses as opposed to appealing to your heart before God. And so all of these passages show us this. Jesus is warning us that they are coming, um, that deceivers are coming. So let's look and see in the middle of page 29, a historical look at heresies. Um, a heresy is a deviation. Fill that in. A heresy is a deviation. That means a detour. You can put a detour on there. It's a deviation from the church's historical teaching on, underline it, foundational biblical doctrines. We could put out there to the side orthodoxy. Orthodoxy does not always mean the Greek Orthodox Church. Orthodoxy is speaking about the things that, that have been in play, the things have been long accepted. And it's a very dangerous thing when in the present day we start to hear something new. When somebody comes along sharing something new and perspectives that are new, we need to go, hmm, let's be careful. Because orthodoxy or the foundational biblical truths that have, that have lasted for 2,000 years are generally the picture of where we find our greatest safety. So we don't want to run to something new all the time. And this is often what happens is heresies come along and they're talking about something new or there's a new angle, a new twist. And we need to be very careful about that. Look at Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. And so here we see that the, the gospel that is being preached in Acts 24 is not something new. What they're saying is, look, I believe the Old Testament truth. That's what was being proclaimed. Now, they were, they were saying, you guys think we're a Jewish sect? We're not a Jewish sect, if, but we believe in the fulfillment of what we have seen in the Old Testament. So we see that at the very start. We see the, the proclamation that what they believed was actually the orthodox truth of the Old Testament. Notice the next part, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. But false prophets arose also, or also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Wow. Who will secretly, there's that idea, crept in again, who will secretly bring in destructive what? Heresies. Heresies. Even denying the master who what? Bought them. Not brought them. Bought them. You see, he bought us with his own blood, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So again, Peter is warning the early church that they're bringing in, they're creeping in, and they're bringing in something that denies Christ. So not only is it a heresy, a deviation, but notice this. Heretical teaching presents another God or another gospel. So it's either presenting another God or it's presenting another gospel. And by presenting another God, you're presenting another gospel. Um, let's turn the page, page 30. Notice the common Trinitarian heresies. And there's two areas of heresy that we're going to look at. There are many different areas of heresy. But remember, a heresy is saying, hey, foundational biblical truths that, you, that are critical unto salvation, if you deviate from them, then you're talking about full-on heresy. It's possible to be in error, but not be a heretic. You can be off on something that maybe isn't critical unto salvation. 
Um, in fact, this is where we begin to see lots of splitting as time goes on um, of different perspectives on what the Bible is saying, on what the Bible is there. But we, we want to be very, very clear that the Bible is very, very clear on the base doctrines, especially those that are what we would call unto salvation or the things that are salvific in nature, the things that point to how is it that Christians can make it off this dirt ball alive. And the only way to make it off this dirt ball alive is to be in Jesus. That's the only way that we get out of here alive. And so here we see the Trinitarian heresies. These are a key part. And it's very interesting that many of these were being worked out in the, just immediately as soon as the church was launched. We see in the first, second, and third centuries that these, these questions immediately came up. Who, how, how do we reconcile the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the apostles? And how do we look at them and understand them? And in those early years, even while Paul was still alive and preaching, he would go preach the gospel to a town. People would get saved. He would put them on the right track. He would disciple them. They would have some leaders and he would move on to the next town. And who was coming into town after he left? Very often there were other heretics. There were other teachers saying, man, this way is so powerful. This way is so great. All these people are responding. Oh yeah, I'm like Paul. Listen to me. And he starts to see it. And then they would turn that interest toward themselves and profit off of it, or use the sake of the gospel for either sensual things, or personal things, or status things, and all of those things. So there, were, there was a constant early movement away from the base truths of the gospels. I think that this is part of the reason God gave it to us in what is present day paper and ink, um, but in physical form, so that we can see and hear his word in such a beautiful way, and go back and study it, and begin to chew on the deep depth of it and compare the truths of God's word to the new things that we're hearing around us so that we can know what the truth is. So the first one we want to look at here, notice the Trinitarian um, heresies here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, this is the passage, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Now, modalism is one of the first things that comes along that we see here, and it denies the first of the foundational truths that we talked about last week. Now, remember with me and fill that in, modalism, what, what was the first one? God is three persons. Modalism is one of the distortions of the first one, and I want you to see what we mean by that. So you may want to put underneath that, God is three persons persons. That, that, that's not clear on the outline. I want to make sure you get that fresh in your mind when you go back and look at it. What is the first foundational truth of the Trinity? God is three persons. That's the first, and that's what modalism confuses. You see, instead of three distinct persons, God has three distinct, fill it in, modes, and that's not correct. You know, you're, you, you, we have a lot of things in our life that you can put it in different modes. Um, some of you have a drill, and that drill, there's something called a hammer drill that some of you have, and it's a drill that you can go through wood or you can go through metal with that, but if you need to go through concrete, you switch it over into another mode, and it, it's a hammer drill. It, it, it hits and it impacts as it drills, and it goes through concrete much better. So for the guys, I'm sharing with you, there's different modes that we have. I, I see chefs that are in this room tonight, and they have huge mixers, and they can put those mixers in different modes for different purposes and so forth. Well, the modalists would say, well, God comes to us and he's in different modes. And so he's not, he's not really all of these things at once. He just appears. He has three different masks. Here's the problems with this. Notice the problems that are here on your outline. First of all, this denies the relationships within the Trinity. You remember we've said within the Trinity, the happy land of the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Spirit perfectly united together, perfectly relating to one another, and perfectly perfectly working together 
for all of his glory and for all of his purposes. This is the beauty of the Trinity, is that there are three persons and they're in perfect harmony. This is the essence and the nature of God. Well, what we see when you go to modalism, it's saying, nope, he's either God the Father, or then he's God the Son, or when is needed, he is God the Spirit. And that is simply incorrect. It destroys the idea of the Holy Trinity working together. Notice the next bullet point there. It ignores the separation of the person's in scripture there are times in scripture where we see christ speaking to the father or the father speaking to the son or the spirit coming in and working in conjunction with the father and the son and so you if you if you're a modalist you don't get that in the scripture you can't have that in the scripture and so it undermines the separation of those look at the next one there It undercuts, and this is so important, it goes back to what we studied last week, it undercuts the doctrine of the atonement. How does it undercut the doctrine of the atonement? I'm going to ask you to um, go back and look with me. I want you to back up, and um, if you have, I hope you you have your notes um, that are here, but the the picture of this, and in, in, in we see as the, as the sun begins to work in our salvation, look at page 25. In the work of creation, God the Father speaks. This is in the middle of the page. In the work of creation, God the Father speaks, God the Son implements, and God the Spirit brings completion. Flip the page. On page 26... The work of salvation, and here's the doctrine of the atonement. God the Father sends the what? The Son for our salvation. God the Son becomes flesh or incarnate for our salvation and lays down his life. And then look at the bottom one. God the Spirit applies to us the blessings of salvation. So the Spirit comes and works within our hearts and comes and brings to us faith to look and to see and to believe and brings to us the regenerating power of God. So for the modalist, they don't say, they would say, oh no, God the Father decided to send himself and so he changes out of God the Father, becomes God the Son, does his thing, and then we see he switches over to God the Spirit. That is simply, part of the reason that, that this heresy would come up in the early church is because there were people that just, they couldn't understand that their human logic was seeking to rule over what God's word had said. And so now with 2,000 years of, of, of clear logic and, and clear history, we have the benefit of standing on the shoulders of the early saints who said, no, that's not what Jesus said and that's not what God did. And, and they stood proudly and they stood clearly saying, no, you're, not, you're wrong. God is not in three different modes. He is three in one and he's always three in one. Look at the next one. Arianism. Arianism denies the second foundational truth. And what is the second foundational truth? Notice on the screen right here, the second foundational truth is what? Each person is fully God. Arianism came along and said, well, that's not really true, especially around the person of Christ. But notice this with me. Um, Subordinationism teaches that the Son is eternal, not created, and divine, but still not equal to the Father in being or attributes. And so the Arianists would they would they would not recognize Jesus as God. Or if he was God, he was like a lesser God. He wasn't the God of the Trinity. Look at the next part that is here. Adoptionism. Adoptionism teaches that Jesus lived as an ordinary man until his baptism. And then God adopted Jesus as his son and conferred upon him supernatural powers. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, mainly that we, we see his virgin birth. We see his glorious, clear biblical lineage and the clear biblical promise that the Messiah would come. And we, in hindsight, look and see, oh, he's going to be God. That becomes very clear as we see the Old Testament and then we see the person of Christ. But these would say, well, 
Maybe he didn't really do anything that was miraculous before the wedding at Cana, and so he wasn't really God. Instead of recognizing that he had emptied himself to become a man and lived in obedience to the Father's plan, and then at the right time, he fulfilled his mission and his calling, which is what we would see clearly in the Word of God, not only in the Gospels, but also in the letters. So what about contemporary Arianism? Contemporary Arianism means modern day Arianism, not something from the second, third, or fourth century. See, we see this clearly when it comes to Islam. A core distinction between Christianity and Islam would be the idea of Arianism. Um, we would say that Muslim people who believe Islam would say that, that they would be victims of Arianism because they don't believe that Jesus was God. They, they believe that Jesus came and he was a prophet. He, was not, he had some special powers and he had some special gifts, but he was not God in the flesh, certainly not Messiah. Um, they would also say that he did not die on the cross. In fact, he is the only, excuse me, Islam is the only religion that would say that Jesus did not die on the cross. All of the other typical religions that recognize Christianity, recognize, in, including Jews and including Roman historians, including East historians, West historians, um, all sects of Christianity would all say that Jesus died on the cross. Islam does not believe that. They believe he was taken off of the cross before he died. Very interesting that they would deny one of the key aspects of the atonement, which is death in the place of our sins for our atonement. Notice the next part here. Contemporary Arianism would see a core distinction between Christianity and the cults. The cults very, very often place Jesus in a different category than God as deity. Not only Arianism and modalism, but also polytheism. And this denies the third of the foundational um, parts of the Trinity, or the foundational ideas of the Trinity. And what is the third one is here? There is what? One God. And so what happens is there are certain cults that come along and there are certain ideas that say, nope, there's multiple gods. And we're going to see that in the coming weeks. Very popular heresies, excuse me, very popular even cults here in Hollywood, Florida, who teach polytheistic views. They do not teach a monotheism. They do not teach, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They have to alter that because they're polytheists, even in the name of Christ. And we're going to see those um, next week. Notice the next part, page 31. Not only do we see Trinitarian um, heresies in this way, but notice it's the worship of one God. That's, that's the idea of the polytheistic ideas, um, that, that they don't worship one God. It's the worship of more than one God. That's what, that's what they're doing. Um, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 20 through 22. Look what it says there at the top of the page. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I the Lord? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. Isn't that beautiful that God calls himself right here in the Old Testament the Savior? There is none besides me. Underline that. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. This is one of many places that we see in God's word where God is clearly saying, all those other gods you talk about, they're a fairy tale. They are not real. I am the one true God. Um, Isaiah 44, Habakkuk chapter 2 also. So we've looked at Trinitarian heresies. In fact, put a big circle around that on page 30 where it says Trinitarian heresies. Put a big circle around that. And then over at the next one, in the middle of page 31, put a big circle around Christological heresies. So not heresies about the Trinity, 
But these are heresies about the person of Christ. These are heresies about who was Jesus. Um, and we see this in 1 John chapter 2 in verse 18. Again, read, uh, written toward the end of the first century. Notice what it says. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so many Antichrists have come. Antichrist is not always the idea of the beast. There is there's a few different uses of the picture of the word of Antichrist and someone who comes and who works against the gospel, someone who has accepted the gospel and then denied the gospel, those are Antichrists. And so we see this here. And, and of course, they're fueled by the ultimate Antichrist, which would be Satan. But here we see he's saying that they are coming and they have now come. Look in the middle of that. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all in you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and there is no lie in the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies, look what it says, who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's worth underlining for you to go back and remember this glorious statement. Who is the liar? It's the one who denies Jesus is the Christ. Part above the Christ, Messiah. Or the anointed one. This is the one who's going to take away our sin. This is the one who's going to save us from ourselves. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And so the picture here is... There is no way around Jesus when it comes to getting to heaven. There is no way around Jesus when it comes to getting to God the Father. If you want the Father, you have to come through Jesus the Son. Look at the Arian and Arianism and Ebonid Eben, this is Ebenitism, Ebenitism, um, two other heresies that come along around who Jesus was. And what is the, what do they say? First of all, Jesus is not fully God. That's what they would say. Jesus is not fully God, similar to some of the other heresies, but these are specifically around the person of Christ. Apollinarianism and Doticism says this, Jesus is not fully man. So, but the picture of the New Testament is that this is fully God in fully man. You say, well, how can you explain that? I cannot. I don't have to explain that. The Bible simply tells me that this is what God has designed. Nestorism, Nestorianism, Nestorianism teaches this, that Jesus' humanity and deity are two distinct persons. And so Jesus' humanity and Jesus' deity are two distinct persons. They are not one person. But the Bible very clearly teaches us that Jesus is both man and he is God. And so the Christological heresies come along and they, they throw the church into a huge debate. And the debate lasts for a couple of centuries. And so as people would gather together and read the scriptures from the Old Testament to the words of Jesus from the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the early letters that were circulated very clearly that had these special marks of just being the word of God that the Holy Spirit had brought the canon together. As that happened, there was great debate over who are who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the person of Christ? And how do they relate together? So the church fathers had councils. And some of these councils lasted a hundred years. What we mean by that is they would come and they would come and they would talk and they would pray and they would debate. And then they would come and they would talk and they would pray and they would debate. And then they would come and there were, there were scholars that were coming together, pastors, Christians that were coming together to work through these things. So what happened was they eventually said, well, wait a minute, we have this group over here that's saying this and this group over here that's saying this and this group over here that's saying this. We must say, what does God's word clearly say? Not a particular personality that has shown up here in Chalcedon, 
making an argument, not, not someone who's persuasive like a great lawyer or a great philosopher, but what does the word say? That's how these councils worked. So they were, they were ferreting out what is the difference between the powerful personalities or even the movements that are going on in Samaria or the movements that are going on in Libya or the movements that are going on in Numidia, which is North Africa. There were different movements and they would show up at the councils and they would say, okay, well, some of these people may be pretty powerful. May, they may have a following, but just because they have a following doesn't mean that they are lining up with Scripture. And so as a result of that, they would come together and say, what has God's word said? And then they would declare a creed. And this creed would call people to either come in line with what the scripture says and who we understand Jesus to be, or it would say, you are not part of Orthodox Christianity. You are not part of the true church. And so I am so thankful for the creeds from the early church. I am so thankful that they came to establish and to help us define this. And so notice this one. And this was from 451 AD in Chalcedon, the Chalcedonian Creed. And notice what it says here. Therefore, and just catch the language of this. This is beautiful. Therefore, following, following the Holy Fathers, these are the, the early church leaders, therefore following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood. Do you see what they're saying? He is God and he is man. Truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead. So he's, he's, he's the same as God. This is the picture of one substance with the Father as, as in regard. And as the same time, at the same time of one substance with us as regards to his manhood. Let us in all respects, apart from sin, as regards his Godhead, begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood, begotten for us men and of our salvation, of Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in, what does it say? Two natures, that's God and man, without confusion, Without change, without division, without separation, the distinction of the natures being in no way annulled by the union. So he's saying, because he is man, it doesn't mean he's not God. And because he is God, it doesn't mean he's not man. Do you see that that is there? It says, what does it say there at the next part? But rather the characteristics of each, neighbor, each nature, that's God nature and man's nature, being preserved and coming together to form one person and substance, substance. Not as parted or separated in two persons, but one and the same, Son and only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ. Even as the prophets from the earliest times spoke of him and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. So this was the council of the Chalcedonian Creed. And this is saying, no, remember what Jesus said. If you see me, you've seen the father. Oh, he's the, he is God. And, and he's, yet he says, this is the son of man. This is man born of a woman. And he has come to be the sacrifice for our sins. And so this was, this was very clearly stated. In the coming weeks, we're going to see why this is so important. When we start looking into cults and how they twist and how they turn and how they say who Jesus is and who Jesus isn't, you and I need to remember that he is fully God and he is fully man and that the Holy Spirit and the Father are one with him. And so he is working out his glory in this way. Notice the next one, the Nicene Creed. And this is from 381 AD. And many of you, how many of you grew up in a church where there would be a creed? 
in some sort or another occasionally read or occasionally stated. So many of you, I see, I see hands up, that you remember different creeds. Here's the Nicene Creed from 381. Look what it says. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Begotten, not made. This means he's coming from him, eternally coming from the Father, eternally emanating from the Father, being of one substance with the Father. This is one God by whom all things were made. The scripture makes very clear, this is the creator God. All things come through him. Notice the next part. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate. What does that mean? In the flesh. He came in the flesh by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. That means the Holy Spirit caused Mary to conceive him in the flesh. That's what that statement is about. It says, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose. A very, very important part of the, the gospel story is that he not only died, but he rose again. You have no gospel if he did not rise again. So this is very clearly saying in the Creed, he rose again according to the scriptures. That means just like the scriptures said that he would, he did. And ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. So this is the one true God who brings salvation and judges all of creation. Look at the last part here, the last two parts. And I believe in the Holy Ghost. So the first one is Father Almighty, and then the second one is Jesus Christ the Lord. And here's the third one. The creed comes now to the Holy Spirit. So you see this early important Nicene Creed is dealing with the Trinity. It's dealing with the nature of God. We have to know who God is if we're going to assess beliefs of other groups and other things. So look what this one is. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. So you can worship the Holy Spirit. You should worship the Holy Spirit. Who spoke by the prophets. So the Holy Spirit comes and he speaks through the prophets. As we're studying Hosea, the Holy Spirit came and inspired Hosea to say what he said and do what he did. You remember, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Hosea and said, Hosea, go and marry a what? A whore. Go and marry a promiscuous woman. And so we, we see the Holy Spirit is working in this. This is where we see that. Look at the last paragraph here. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic does not, we're not talking about the Roman Catholic church. We're talking about the universal body of Christ. And that's, that's, that's what we're saying. You say, well, we're reading the Apostles' Creed sometime at Sheridan Hills. We're going Catholic. No, not at all. Long before the Catholic church came along in, in earnest was these, were these creeds of declaration of our faith. And very important to us. And as times get muddier and muddier and muddier, muddier in our world even now, theologically speaking, it's important for churches like ours to remember the creeds that were true to the gospel and true to orthodoxy. So we can read this with joy. We can say, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You say, you look for the resurrection of the dead, and that a lot of stuff on television, that sounds terrible. Is that around Halloween? What are you talking about? Oh, friends, don't let the culture influence all your thoughts on that. The greatest resurrection of the dead are the promises of this when Jesus says, when he comes, our bodies are going to be raised with him to a glorified life in Christ. We will be raised in him. And this is the true resurrection of the dead. When you die, you're not laying in a grave for all of eternity, either being 
condemned in silence or condemned in the picture of the punishment of your sin, the picture is because of Christ. You are raised up to a new life in Christ as will be for yours in eternity. And so this is the beautiful resurrection of the dead. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world that is to come. Um, So the, the creeds, I hope that you're seeing, the creeds are all because there were heresies that were floating around. There was confusion about what the apostles said. There was confusion about the words of Christ. And there, was, there were all kinds of charlatans coming along and deceiving the early church and seeking to turn it for themselves. Now, we want to look at a contemporary look at cults and counterfeit gospels. And if we're going to do that, we need some definitions. So the first one is the word cult. Put a big circle around the word cult because we need to understand what a cult is. A cult is this. Here's the idea. Groups which claim to be in harmony with Christianity but deny foundational Christian doctrines. So they claim to be Christian But they deny, and look what it says, foundational Christian doctrines. What are foundational Christian doctrines? The idea of the Trinity. The idea of Christ is God. The idea that there's salvation only in Christ. They deny some of those things. Um, Look at the next bullet point that is there. Here's what they generally do. They generally follow the instruction of one individual who dictates false teachings. So very often someone will take the Christian gospel and tailor it to his own ideas and start powerfully presenting it. Now, I'd like for you to give me a few examples of a cult where one person comes along and starts presenting that. Say it again, Tim. Mary Eddie Baker. Baker. We're going to study Mary Eddie Baker. Who else? Jim Jones Jones and the Guyana Tragedy. He was a preacher from Texas. Another preacher from Texas, David Koresh, um, down in Waco, I mean Waco, Texas. Yeah, Um, but we 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 all thought that as the kids, you know, and everything else. I mean, we 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 all looked at that. We go, man, what are these guys doing? These people following this guy. And you remember, he he was he was seeking to um, have all the women, and he had children from all over the place. I mean, this was this was about money and sex and power. And control. I mean, that, that's what we see. But they're not all David Koresh's, and they're not all Jim, Jim Jones's. Um, there's others sometimes that are very nice, sweet little old men that come along. What did you just say? I didn't hear what he said. Joel Osteen. Okay, that's a different thing that we're going to deal with that, and it can become rather cultish. Um, and that, but there's, that's a different issue, and we'll look at that. Um, but notice that here with me, generally they follow one man. See, look in Matthew 24, verse 24, um, we see, the for, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. These are God's children. And it say, if, to, as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So that's, that's how intense it will be. Notice the next one is here. Not just one guy, but they're not to be confused with the occult. Circle the word occult. How is the cult different, the occult, different from a cult? And I want you to see this here. The occult does this. The occult attempts to gain supernatural knowledge or power apart from the God of the Bible. So um, this, is, this is where there are, there are people that are denying God and not even looking to God, but instead they're looking to a powerful being besides God, which means ultimately they're looking to where? They're looking to Satan. And I want you to see this in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse, verse 6. And this is the Old Testament law. If a person turns to mediums or necromancers, whoring after them, that means going out after them, as, as we see that, that idea of, uh, from Hosea, like they're prostituting themselves, going after them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from among his people. Um, There are many examples in both the Old Testament and the New Testament of the occult coming into contact with God's people. 
Um, notice on the next page, in page 34, at the top, where it says 1 Timothy 4 and 1. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to what? Deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And so, some of the apostates are actually going towards satanic and demonic involvement in worship. Look at the bullet point that is here underneath 1 Timothy verse 4. And everyone needs to see this. It includes fortune telling, witchcraft, tarot cards, crystal balls, horoscopes, Ouija boards, and many other things. I want to take just a minute to comment on this because we're not going to deal with the occult as much as we're going to deal with the cult, with um, cults that are, that are particular. But young people, I just want you to clearly hear. You must never, ever, ever mess around with seances and with seeking to speak to the dead and groups of people that think it's kind of cool and kind of freaky and kind of mysterious to mess with tarot cards or palm readings or any of those things because those things are seeking to access Satan. And strongholds, openings can be made where you don't want what comes out of that. So whenever you see something, whenever you click on something, and it is starting to, to look like something of one of these, the occult, that is something that we don't even play with. We don't even act like it. We don't even laugh at it. Listen to this. You don't watch it in the movies and in shows. You don't read it in popular books. I want to warn you to stay away from the occult. It is a slippery slope that will deceive you and it will, in fact, harm your life. So let's be very careful about that. We need to, we need to be clear of this, that you don't want to go messing with trying to talk to the dead or speak with um, people from the past. Um, those are very, very dangerous things. The counterfeit gospel. And now, this is something that we are going to study um, in, in detail here. First of all, what is the counterfeit gospel? Not necessarily a cult, but a counterfeit gospel. A fraudulent imitation of the gospel that simply deceives. That's what it is. It's a fraudulent imitation. It, it looks like the gospel, but it's not. And it simply deceives. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And who would mind reading that? Real loud? Can I, I'm going to call on Chuck. Chuck, do you mind reading Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9? Everybody look at that and read it. I am astonished. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him and he called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some of you who, who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should... anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. So twice, this very clear injunction, you be careful to stay away from this foolishness. Now, as we look at these and as we start to really look at groups and we start to look at personalities, um, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. And the first question is this on the bottom of page 34. Look at this. Shouldn't we just focus on the one true gospel and ignore false teachings? Some people would say, why are we going to go look at, at the cults and the counterfeit gospels? Shouldn't we just ignore those? No, I don't think so. Because they're so powerful and they're so prevalent. It's not that we go study them to believe them. It's to go, that we go study them enough to identify where they are wrong. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves 
and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Look what it says. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day and night to admonish every one of you with tears. We are called to be careful and to be alert at the, at the contradicting gospels that come along. Top of page 35. Here's another question. Is it unloving to name false teachers? Is it unloving if we name names? Is it unloving to call a spade a spade when we're here? And this is important. I'm, I'm going to ask you to make some notes off to the side here for just a moment um, as well. But this first passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, is a very sobering passage. First of all, roughly, how many years has this been circulated among Christians? How many years has 2 Timothy been in circulation among Christians? About. How long? About 2,000 years, right? So for about 2,000 years, the church has been reading this, this statement. And there are two names that for 2,000 years, Christians have known these names of guys who departed from the gospel. I don't want to be one of them. Notice what it says here. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. So here are two guys that come along with their her heresy. And they've been named, and for 2,000 years, Old Hymenaeus and Philetus were named among the church. We know that, but here's the example. I, I wouldn't want to be those. Write down off to the side, shipwreck, and write 1 Timothy 1.19. In 1 Timothy 1.19, there is the warning that Hymenaeus... And Alexander suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith because they did not continue with the gospel. Write down another one. How about Philippians 4.23? This is Euoda and Seneca. Euoda and Seneca were two women in the Philippian church that couldn't get along with each other. And so they got their names in the Bible for 2,000 years as women that needed to have peace with each other, that were upset with each other. Wow. We don't want to be those. So we see that the New Testament names names when it's important and when it's appropriate. Um, notice Titus chapter 1 and verse 10 through 11. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those among the circumcision party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for same to game what ought not to be te taught. Or excuse me, what they ought not to teach. And so it, it is appropriate that we name names um, in this day and time. And not just about heresies, but there's other people who are thieves, and there's other people who are deceivers, and there's other people who get off on weird, weird tangents in life. And maybe for their own game or gain, or maybe it's because of some other deception. It's appropriate that we name that. Here's the next question. Is it uncaring to criticize other beliefs? Is it uncaring to criticize other beliefs? We live in a time when nobody should be wrong. We live in a time where it's unpopular to say anyone is, anything is wrong. In fact, it's extreme how far that goes. Um, if you say that someone's wrong, you're, you're in danger of offending them. And um, when it comes to truths for eternity, this is a dangerous thing for us to, to have a mentality of. Um, no, it's completely correct that we would criticize things that are of eternal nature that can bring people to damnation and destruction. 
that is appropriate that we sound the alarm, that we say the name, and we say, this is incorrect and this is wrong. Now, I can't believe it. I looked at it today as I was putting the PowerPoint together. Do you remember when we studied the book of Jude? I, I would have thought that was like last year or the year before. You guys, when we studied Jude, that was four years ago. Is that right, Pastor Ben? 2015, we studied the book of Jude. To those of you who are new to us, you missed that study. But after we had studied the book of John, God led us to, he really and spoke to my heart when I was down in the Keys, spending time with him, and it was just a very, very clear impression from him as I was reading the word. The church needs to hear the message of these little 25 verses of the book of Jude. Very short little letter, and we spent 13 sermons on that short little letter. And the letter of Jude is all about false teachers. The whole thing is about false teachers. He wanted to write to them about the gospel, but he said, instead, I have to write to you about the false teachers that are hitting you guys. And so the, the words of Jesus were, the wolves are going to come. The word of Jude is, they're here. That's the picture. And they're among you. And that was in the first century. That was... 2000, 1900 years ago. Look at the next slide here. Um, just want to want to see. Um, and in fact, go back to the first one there. Do you see the background? Do you see the background behind you? A lot of people didn't know what that was. But I want to show you what that was in the background. Go to the next one here, and then the next one. Um, so we were describing apostate believers. That is the background. That's what the background of that behind the Jude was. We just reduced them. Go to the next one that is there. Um, you you start to see we. Pastor Ben actually made that graphic, if I remember right. Um, but it was, it was a beautiful picture. Nobody knew through the study what it was until we revealed the background is all of these false teachers. And there's, of course, hundreds more than this. But teaching and preaching the gospel for their own gain, for their own $11 million house, or their own $45 million jet, or for, those, for their own um, sexual gratification with multiple people around the world, or for their own status, for their own egos, for their own whatever it is. And so we... So, well, I'm glad that some of you don't know who they are. That's good. Um, in fact, change the picture because I don't want them to study them too much. These are false teachers that are on television. These are false teachers that, that someone last, excuse me, two nights ago, I was seeing someone and they said, um, do you know Andrew Walmack? I said, I don't know Andrew Walmack. And they said, well, you know, I believe in Andrew Walmack. Blah, blah. And he was, he was wanting to talk about Andrew Walmack, not wanting to talk about Jesus. And, and eventually he said, well, I give money to Andrew Wilma. This is a very disturbed individual. But we, we begin to see that. I mean, I have an aunt that gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to the people on television. Um, because she had been drawn in, and in her will, and in her death, she gave... She gave away to the people that had come and deceived her in this. Now, you know what? We have people who leave estate to the gospel here at Sheridan Hills or to the IMB or to other things that are gospel-centered and clearly Christ-exalting. That is a wonderful thing to do with our estate. But when we see the deceivers come in, they will, they will have their way any way that they can for their own power and for their own exaltation. And so it's appropriate that we name names. It's appropriate that the people of Sheridan Hills are warned and that Christians around the world are warned of people who claim to be God, of people who claim to be God's final apostle, of people who claim to be doing God's work when it's really for themselves. Look at the last page in page 36, examples. So the cults and the counterfeit gospels we will not cover directly are listed here. There's, these are a few of them. We'll touch on some of them. Um, but the ones that we will look at, and in fact we're going to add a few to this um, list as we go, but the cults and the counterfeit gospels that we will cover directly are Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, Catholicism, prosperity gospel, which we've just seen pictures of primarily, and theological liberalism. Um, so we'll look at these big ones. We'll look at the ones that have, have, have affected millions quite clearly. 
and um, we will begin to see the difference and see why they say what they say and why we would say that they are clearly out of step with God's word.